like low level 11 competing in the grueling 1984 Paris Dakar rally. But this was not all 9-11. Beneath its skin, the beginnings of a new car, the Porsche 959. Only 200 twin turbocharged car will ever be built. Just enough to meet international regulations for Group B motor racing competition. And when they are put together, they'll look well here. But this car has emerged out of that rally, a prototype of the Porsche 959, which embodies many of the features it's been developing for the last several generations. It's the car Porsche plans will take them into the 21st century. And in terms of high technology, it's of the 21st century. The 959 is, in every sense, an engineer's car, though in appearance it has the future stamped all over it. Its enormous power plant, its four-wheel drive, its ground-hugging capacity and its electronics packages are, Porsche admits, more than the average motorist wants or needs. But here in the Porsche laboratories, is living proof that engineers still believe the car has a long way to go and is complete. According to Porsche's head of research, Helmut Bott, who conceived the 959, this car will embody and test every possible state-of-the-art automotive technology, which will eventually be transferred to other Porsche vehicles, like the 911, the 944, and the 928. The brief for the 959 was simple. High performance meeting strict fuel emission controls, fuel efficiency, a four-wheel drive and an air and water-cooled engine. Most Porsche vehicles are air-cooled, but it was considered that the sheer heat being generated by this engine would require additional cooling. So the cylinders are air-cooled and the cylinder heads are water-cooled. This alone generates an extra 150 horsepower units for each cylinder. And where does all that energy go? Well, at its maximum speed, in excess of 300 kilometres an hour, the 959 generates 200% more energy than the 911 doing its maximum speed of 2 With that kind of engine output, allowing acceleration from 0 to 100 kilometres an hour in 5 seconds, the task of putting that amazing amount of torque safely and efficiently through all four wheels was not insignificant. Porsche have used electronics to optimize performance out of all four wheels and stretching to the leading edge of technology have programmed the car's torque biasing to suit at least four different road conditions. The car's own intelligence tells it how to drive. Once engineering specifications are determined, another team of designers takes over. These are mostly London School of Design trained, and their task is to sell cars to people who care more about a leather trim than a slip differential. Though Porsche's head of design, Tony Lapine, says buying a Porsche is something else entirely. When you buy a Porsche, you don't you don't buy a Porsche so much in the showroom. You, it, it's a thing that you it probably happens in, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning in bed. You, you finally are ready to buy a Porsche. And then the reasons that you have for that purchase are very, very private and very much your own. This is an exact one to five scale model of the Porsche 959. 
This clay and metal model precedes the development of most new production lines at Porsche. But with the 959, designers were given a deadline of about three months before a prototype had to come out. So this scale model was aerodynamically tested in a wind tunnel, given the green light, and from there the artist could take over from the engineer. Working within very narrow parameters, the artist goes to the two-dimensional palette and begins shaping and giving the 959 it, its own character. Clay modelling follows, with style never allowed to impinge on the vehicle's aerodynamics. The visible portions of the car's body are fashioned from a thin moulding of Kevlar reinforced plastic. Of the exterior panels, only the doors and the front bonnet are metal, and they are aluminium. But aesthetics aside, it's on the road that the car shows off. Its rear engine with a six-speed gearbox to cover the range gives the car extraordinary traction in cornering. And despite the electronics package which provides just the right amount of thrust on all four wheels, whatever the road surface, driving the 959 is like trying to tame a wild animal. And just for the record, all 200 vehicles in the limited edition series have been spoken. This is the town of Fontremer in the Pyrenees, in between France and Spain. It's a pretty little place, a holiday resort. People come here to ski, to take the air, and to get a suntan. And that's not the only thing they do with the sun here as well. 1,700 metres up in the French Pyrenees, the Cyclops' eye of the solar receiver tower is lording it over a vast field of mirrors. Targasson, near Fontremer, is one of the sunniest places in France, and it's here that the National Centre for Solar Studies is conducting one of its most ambitious solar experiments. There are a number of different ways of generating energy from the sun. The Targasson experiment is unusual in that the heat generated is stored in melted salts and circulated to the solar receiver at the top of the tower. This is France's most impressive solar experiment to date, not just for the level of the technology, but for the outstanding beauty of the location itself. What's happening is that the rays from these 201 heliostats are being concentrated at the very heart of the solar receiver. And even on a bright, cold day like today, it's receiving temperatures of somewhere around 520 degrees Celsius. The field of mirrors, or heliostats, track the sun as it moves across the sky, controlled by a computer. The heat concentrated at the centre of the tower is phenomenal. Visitors are warned about being caught in the rays, while the birds that nest at the base of the tower are wise enough to keep out of them. Since it started operations, the Themis solar power station has produced an average of 3 million kilowatt hours of electricity a year. But the really interesting aspect of its operation is contained in the plant room, 
Here, a system of pipes conveys the molten salt to the top of the tower. The problem with collecting energy from the sun is not the collecting, but the storing of it. And at Targason, they store that energy in molten salt. Looks like ordinary table salt. In fact, it's a composition of sodium nitrite, sodium nitrate and potassium nitrate. That's circulated through the receiver tower. It's preheated to a temperature of 250 degrees. The temperature is then boosted when it reaches those rays from the heliostats to a temperature of 430 degrees Celsius. And it ends up in one of these two huge storage tanks. The molten salt is then used to heat water, which produces steam, which in turn drives a turbine, which produces electricity. The performance of the power station is monitored in the control room. There are a variety of instruments measuring devices for flux and weather, an infrared camera and ultrasonic flow meters. Up here in the control room you can monitor the performance of the heliostats in the field. You can also check for the prevailing wind conditions and that has been a problem here at Targason because when the station was being built some of the heliostats did blow over. Up on the wall you can see the wattage per square meter that the heliostats are registering today. The solar receiver itself is under surveillance from a closed circuit television camera. There are in fact five heliostats today which are not, not operating. However, should we want to take one out of service, we very quickly can. And you can see the spot of light disappearing from the television screen. Okay, Eric, could you hit it? Well, here we are at the top of the tower. And as soon as you step out of the lift, some of that 520 degrees Celsius heat hits you in the face. Below me, you can see some of the network of tubes carrying the molten salt to the center of the receiver. And the heat really is quite incredible up here. In its first 12 months of operation, the Themis plant has consistently supplied two and a half megawatts of electrical power, enough to provide all the lighting and heating needs for the town of Fontremer. At the moment, the French Electricity Authority is studying proposals for a larger project developing 20 megawatts. Even so, with France committed to the generation of electricity from nuclear power stations, the future for solar in France is far from rosy. Environmentally, solar energy makes good sense. The sun, after all, is not a diminishing energy reserve, it's always there. And demonstrably, this power station works. It's providing two and a half megawatts of power for the French national grid. The point is, though, that power is 20 times more expensive to produce than that generated from nuclear. So it's hardly surprising that the French Electricity Commission is getting cold feet about the idea and may, in fact, decide to withdraw funding. I just hope that governments don't decide to withdraw the cash just because it's no longer politically expedient to back alternative energy. There are over a million home satellite dishes like this dotted across the United States, and the number is growing daily. Above 20 special communication satellites beam down an extraordinary variety of programming. Millions of homes have access to more than 100 channels. They can watch soapies, learn a foreign language, send electronic mail, and bank by satellite. Across the country, the satellite dish is replacing the clothesline or the garden gnome as the center of attention in the backyard. You may wonder, what would it be like to own one? What could you see? Using a 3.5 metre dish, you can pick up the satellites servicing this part of the world. Satellites 36,000 kilometres out in space, though, send back a pretty feeble signal. So the quality of the picture relies on complicated electronics. The size and the correct curvature of the dish is of prime importance. At the moment, we can see three satellites, which bring us a number of services. Intelsat 4 and 4A carry the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and international feeds for Channel 7 and Channel 9 networks. You can also see the American Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. It's a mix of top US network programming and some pretty homespun Armed Forces chat. Sometimes the picture is dreadful, but people who watch it love it. 
It's a bit like it used to be listening to the BBC World Service. By adjusting the direction of the dish, you can also pick up Gorizont 6, the Russian sat satellite, which is quite powerful and offers some interesting insights into life behind the Iron Curtain. This news item is about the stranding of whales on a northern New South Wales beach. Who said they don't know what's going on down under? The sound and picture is, well, interesting. And the cost? It's about $1,200 on a do-it-yourself basis. In August this year, things will begin to change. OSAT launches the first of three satellites from the NASA Space Shuttle. This event will take the home satellite dish out of the arena of the electronic hobbyist and into an entirely different realm. By January 1986, there will be two satellites with a total of 30 channels available. Each will have four high-power 30-watt channels suitable for TV transmission and 11 for commercial TV networking, radio, telephone and data transmissions. The third satellite goes up in mid-86 and is proposed to have four channels allocated for the remaining commercial TV networks. OSAT will provide TV, radio and telephone services to about 350,000 people in remote areas of Australia. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation will be the main user of the system and will achieve a national coverage using the first two satellites. OSAT 1 and 2 will cover Australia and Papua New Guinea with a series of spot and national beams known as footprints. The OSAT satellites are transmitting in a standard known as BMAC, which is different to our normal PAL TV system. BMAC stands for Multiplexed Analog Components Type B. Catchy name. The Department of Communications believes this system provides superior quality pictures and sound. And that's where these one metre satellite dishes come in. Because the signal from OSAT is stronger than other satellites, you can use smaller dishes. The size is also determined by where you are in Australia, in the centre of the footprint or out on the perimeters where the signal is weaker. The drawback is the BMAC system is not compatible with any other satellite transmission in the world. So you'll need a BMAC converter to be able to see the picture on our normal PAL TV sets. To receive OSAT, it'll cost around $2,500. Expensive, but there are considerable gains. The signal can also be shared via coaxial cable with nearby houses or in a block of flats. FM stereo, radio, telephone and modem data links will be available and teleconferencing. Roundtable discussions transmitted via satellite in real time as if it was a Wimbledon final. The only shortcoming is that we can only view Australian originated programming and you'll still need a large dish to satisfy more exotic multinational tastes. So why not have both? And the future. When the history books are written on the close of the 20th century, direct home reception of satellite television may well emerge as having the same effect on our society as the motor car an extraterrestrial technology that may very soon bring us closer to our electronic neighbours. Atlanta Raceway, about 100 kilometres outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And we're here to watch the running of the Atlanta Constitution and Journal Grand Prix. There are over 40 drivers from all over the United States, as well as several international competitors in the race. But whoever wins it, there's one car that seems set to win in the long term, at least, because of the revolutionary engine it uses. It's this one, the Polymotor Lola. And its engine is made of plastic. This is only the fourth time the car has entered a race. And after 40 gruelling laps at an average speed of over 170 kilometres an hour, it's turning in a remarkable performance in second place. The car was brought to Atlanta for the race by its owner, Matty Holtzberg, who's developed the plastic engine over a period of five or six years in his small engine design firm, Polymotor Research Incorporated, in Fairlawn, New Jersey. 
The company had for some time been producing various small engine components made of plastic for racing cars. It was also contracted to carry out a research program for the Ford Motor Company to establish the viability of plastics for use in various parts of internal combustion engines. But the construction of a whole engine of plastic, or at least an engine whose major parts are plastic, has been an exciting and unprecedented development for the automotive world. From the outside, it looks quite conventional, but you get a good idea of how much of the engine is made of plastic in this cutaway illustration. Only the parts shaded blue are made of metal. The orange and yellow parts, which include the sump, the block and the head, as well as the pistons and connecting rods, are made of two different types of carbon fiber reinforced polymers and thermoplastic resins. This is what the component parts look like. First of all, the sump, and you can see quite clearly the, uh, the woven carbon fiber material embedded in the plastic there. And then next comes the block plate, and that looks different, slightly different, but in fact it's the same material with just a slightly different uh, weave. It's a unidirectional weave in the material that's embedded in it. That fits there like that. Then you've got a number of metal cylinder liners that go there like that, and then the block that fits on top of it like that, also made of carbon fiber composite. And the whole lot, at least the plastic components in it, weighs less than 10 kilos. And these are some of the moving parts of the engine that are made of plastic. First of all, and perhaps uh, most surprisingly, the piston itself, although it does have a, a five millimeter facing on the piston crown here that's, uh, that's made of metal, but, uh, and also the piston rings around here. But the bulk of it is just thermoplastic tall-on material. Then there's the connecting rod, uh, and you can see if you look closely there that that also is embedded with a mesh, a woven mesh of uh, carbon fiber. It's very strong, just as strong as steel. Incredibly uh, much lighter though. Then you've got tappets, tappets here made of tallon. Timing gear, which is very accurately molded and just as strong if not better than metal. The gudgeon pin, which is lined with uh, tall-on material, thermoplastic, and then the valves and the valve stems, or at least the valve stems are just made of, uh, of this tall-on plastic material. And the crankshaft, of course, is uh, still made of steel, and that's a very heavy component uh, in the engine. But it's uh, interesting to see just how well both the composite materials and the metal materials marry together. This is the cam cover, for instance, and that's a, a very lightweight piece with uh, carbon fiber material embedded in it and then we've got the cam tray here and you can see there quite clearly how the metal and plastic parts are fitted together perhaps it's even more apparent in this one here which is the head and you can see there metal parts all the way through fitted into into the plastic composite material you can understand very well why plastic engines like this don't melt when all the really high temperature areas like the combustion chambers here are still made of metal. And when it's all put together, you have a two litre, four cylinder, four stroke engine that weighs just 72 kilograms, about 160 pounds. That's less than half the weight of a similar metal engine. It's an engine that has automotive engineers shaking their heads in disbelief. Lola racing car was bought in England and shipped to the United States where the engine was fitted to it last year. The Amoco Oil Company, which produces Torlon, one of the plastic materials used in the motor, and several other companies are now sponsoring the racing program for the Polymotor Lola, which will enable the research and development of the remarkable new engine to continue. And although the Polymotor Lola didn't win the Atlanta Grand Prix, or even place this time, Getting to the top in road racing is a long, hard grind, and Matty Holzberg doesn't expect to do it overnight. However, the car's excellent performance has been attracting increasing attention and recognition, not only in the racing fraternity, 
but in the motoring world generally, as an impressive and significant achievement in automotive engineering. And that's it for another week. Next week on Beyond 2000, scientists begin farming the giant clams of the Great Barrier Reef. They hope to save this magnificent but endangered species and in the process establish a new marine industry. In the Mojave Desert, we fly the experimental light aircraft Long Easy. Designed by Bert Rutan, this home-built craft is almost impossible to stall and holds the American long-distance flight record. And how to go skydiving at very low altitude. Next week, too, a special report. Throughout the world, millions suffer the pain and disability of arthritis. For extreme cases, though, help is on the way as a New York hospital has designed spare parts for the human body. They're just some of our reports next week in Beyond 2000. So until then, goodbye from all of us.